place of like we mentioned in the last scheme. And the Queen is supporting the community with this project. Um, unfortunately, she's had a family emergency come up, so I'm filling in this again. The purpose of this meeting is to get an update on the project and the operations plan. It's also a chance to give some further information on questions that have been frequently asked. The project team is looking to receive your input, further questions and comments on the conditional use permit. I'd like to invite the community's project team to introduce themselves. <coughs> I'm Adam Trump, I'm the Director of Community Development, responsible for uh, planning, permitting, um, Public Works, Union its Operations, GIS, Real Estate, HLD, among others. So uh, that's how I'm involved. I'm here to discuss a little bit of the questions regarding the condition of these permanent buttons. And I'm Kate Silver with the Dow, and I'm tech support for the evening. I'm uh, Saxon Shear, Maintenance and Operations Director, and I am the uh, project manager for the Navigation Center Bill. My name is Joe Drace. I'm the Director of Health and Human Services, which you know is the Anchorage Health Department. I am also a member of the, the former facilitated process for the last eight months. Thanks, everyone. Um, we're going to start today's meeting with an updated presentation on the Navigation Center project, including the Navigation Center design, post operations plan, and feedback on the frequently asked questions. After the presentation, we'll share with you links to where you can reach out to the project team, find further information, and also provide further input and comments. We'll then open the floor for, question, for your questions and comments. Saxton, can I hand over to you to provide an update on the design? Yes, thank you. Uh, currently, the design team is uh, looking at the challenges to present to us the civil uh, stru structure, what you know as previous ASD design, uh, lot between APD administrative building and the evidence storage lot. That lot lends itself to a lot of civil work that had already been done. And so as we've confirmed through the geotechnical analysis, it really uh, uh, has, has uh, explored, I, I guess, developed cost savings in the civil, you know, non cross susceptible build it avoids the need for helical piles, which has helped us save uh, project costs. And so uh, we're, we're able to you know, move forward with this project with a traditional slab on grade footing foundation. And that's been really nice to help bring this project down in cost, um, you know, to we're really targeting that $10 million project estimate. So a lot of nice things that our design team has helped um, uh, target and take advantage of. Uh, current connections to utilities, bringing that lot from the evidence storage lot to the uh, APD administrative building helps us get closer to those existing utilities, which helps save costs. So connecting to the natural gas, the electric, the water, and sewer um, is more advantageous, lower in costs. So, and helps ex expedite project completion. Um, current design right now is really looking at all the uh, infrastructure that will supply and feed and operate this building. Um, walls are being moved as different uh, departments and other stakeholders, subject matter experts contribute towards the needs and operations. And uh, we're uh, approaching 65% design set so right now, working with major stakeholders to uh, uh, run the plan through um, their thoughts. Also working with community councils and other neighbors such as UAA, South, uh, South Central Foundation, ANMC and others, uh, Providence Next. So 65% um, design is our current status. I'll, um, I'm going to uh, hand the mic over to Joe Dreyas, Department of Health uh, Director, to speak on operations and next plans. Thank you. Are you going to advance to that now? So there's been a lot of questions around the operation in the NAV Center. Um, what we have is we have an advisory board that we formed, and uh, it had been uh, under discussion as the facilitated process has changed. We have now launched that. So that advisory board, you think of it like a board of directors at a normal NGO or, or um, you know, a business. And so that group is going to provide the high level. And then what we're going to do is we're going to solicit an RFP for an operator. That operator will then present the programmatic pro pro pieces that will be involved there. And what I mean by that is 
you know, and that's something we're going to judge as part of the RFP process. We might get a super experienced operator that's running an av center in, you know, Houston is one of the common ones. Charleston, South Carolina is another one. They may want to come up here and run this and they would provide all those things in the cost estimate. Whereas we might have someone say, I'll provide basic shelter operations and the MOA would then go find these systematic or, or um, segmented pieces. So that's, that's, we're not here really to discuss that yet because we're just getting initial stages. We've identified the people. I can tell you two of the operational pieces are the MOA themselves is pursuing a subject matter expert with at least five years of, of uh, navigation center operations, a nav center with a co-located shelter. So that's what we're pursuing. We also have an expectation of our partner that is going to operate having their own subject matter expert, either on staff or via retainer for with at least three years. And those are sort of things we feel we're going to make part of the uh, RFP process for the operator. So there's no intention of, of just letting someone that has no experience operate a navigation center. While they may not have experience operating a navigation center, they will be required to have that SME and then that SME will bring the programmatic pieces based on their history of the uh, resources and um, you know guidance that's needed, whether that be a policy on X, Y, or Z, and we could talk about a thousand of those. Um, you know, we've had a lot of lessons as the health department and the MOA in the operation of shelters as we've operated, not just the Sullivan, but the non-congregate sites, done the outreach pieces and all of that. So um, that's, that's kind of the operational piece, but I'll go back here. And this is kind of really the important part. Um, what you have here is that we have committed to a functional zero in two years. So I know before people have said, this thing's gonna be a, a shelter forever. It is not. You know, the idea is to get to functional zero. We're close to functional zero in some small segments. For instance, veterans housing. There are plenty of units out there for, for veterans that are, that are interested in getting veteran housing. And the navigation center serves as that conduit to those social services, not just housing. It could be to get their VA benefits. It could be to get that. And it, this is for all segments. So pick a segment. If they need food stamps, we assist them with food stamps. The navigation center is a social service you know, kind of clearing house for those services. If they need an ID, we have, you know, Tuesdays is DMV day and the DMV's mobile center will come out and help them and get that ID. So if they need to go get a copy of birth certificate, well, vital records will be there, vital statistics will be there and help them with that. So that's the real point of this NAV center. Um, you know, and that's all the things you see here. We're, we have a transportation plan. Not only do you either have to be on a bus stop normally in the normal shelter licensing process, either you have to be on a transit line or have a transportation plan. We're doing both, for instance. So we have about a five-step transportation plan right now, and it's probably going to grow as we get into this. And we can talk about some of those programmatic pieces. But um, as this list says, this really becomes a place that somebody comes and gets navigated the services they need to be successful and get the placement that they desire. This isn't about us telling you where you're going. This is about kind of getting you on the path that you want. So whether that would be to be detoxed, whether that's to treatment, whether it's to job placement or job training, we will have all those resources in the navigation center. Thank you. And I guess the last piece is important, prevention. Right now, what we don't have in Anchorage is a place that you can go to and say, I get evicted in 10 days, or I got a three day eviction notice or a turn off notice and the power gets turned off, the water gets turned off. You know, that, that functionally makes me homeless at this location. I mean, I may have a building over my head, but it doesn't have running water. And so what this navigation center does too is provide those resources to kind of an upstream intervention where we say, great, if it's just that you're $65 short on your rent, let's get you some rental assistance or utility assistance. And that's the real, the real piece that the navigation center will offer that the residents of the MOA is uh, the clearinghouse for those services too. So this isn't just homeless services. This is services for anyone in need. Rapid rehousing, if they, you know, there's people that get kicked out of their housing situation. That's rapid rehousing, another service that'll be offered there. We currently offer this uh, currently in the MOA, but we don't have a, a fixed location for it. Thank you. Um, if you just want to pop back a couple of slides there, Kate, Adam, would you mind providing an update on the permitting process? Sure. Well, this project requires a conditional use permit. Conditional use permits are lined out in Title 21, which identifies our, our land use code. Uh, and it, in regards to the 
conditioning use permit for this specific project, there's several steps that are in that are necessary for a conditional use. Um, as lined out in Title 21, first there's an initiation, right? You, you apply for your conditional use approval. Um, then you have a pre-application conference with the planning department. Then you have your community meeting, which is what this is. And then you um, actually some, uh, your app, you have your application submittal, and then you send out your public notices. The planning department reviews it, then it goes to the planning and zoning, and they say yay or nay. All conditional use permits stop at planning and zoning. Some of the items that are going to be addressed in any conditional use permit that we sub that is submitted to the planning department, it's going to address things like connectivity, um, traffic, how, how are people going to get to and from the facility. It's going to address operations. How is that facility going to be operated on a, on, a, on a daily basis? It's also going to address other concerns that we've had. And I will say Saxon's done a phenomenal job of reaching out to particular stakeholders who have interest in this, such as um, the uh, UAA, um, Alaska Native Medical Center, um, I, I can't even name all the stakeholders. He, he certainly could, but in those conversations, they've expressed certain concerns. And so we have to identify how we're gonna mitigate those things, such as Basher Community Council is very, very concerned about fire, right? Because of the single access up, up to their properties. How are we gonna address that? We, we've addressed that. And if you have questions in regards to that, Saxon can answer that. But those are the kind of things that we're going to address on a wide, uh, very detailed analysis in our in our conditional use. The other thing that has to be that has to be addressed in the in this uh, construction project is the wetlands. I don't know if we if we have a map. Do we have a map up of the pro, of the, the location? I think probably most people here understand where that location is going to be, but. Um, this area has been previously permitted and the, there, there's wetlands to the, if you look on this, it'd be to the south of that, of that product, of the, of the building. And so and you can't just go build on wetlands. You need to get the Army Corps engineer involved. Um, and this project has, this area has been identified multiple times for particular projects. And so credits have been used to purchase those wetlands for, for offsets. Um, and we have to go back to the Army Corps and ask for a modification. I think this is the third or the fourth modification for this area, am I correct, Saxon? Um, because it was originally going to be an expansion for APD, and then it was going to be a bus barn for um, Anchorage School District. And so now we're modifying it again, but we need to get approval from the Army Corps engineers before we can do any considerable work. So, And that application has already been submitted. Um, in regards to building permits, no permits have been applied for yet, although there have been preliminary discussions with Saxon's group, the contractors, I, I think uh, Hipple, probably in MCG, am I correct? They've probably been involved in those. Um, that's kind of the term contract that we've used for, for some work. We have had preliminary discussions with the building uh, building plan review to address, to address any particular concerns such as snow load for the, for the facility. Does it, does it need certain wind, seismic, snow loads? All those kind of things have to be addressed. And so we're getting ahead of that schedule and asking those questions and plan reviews, asking those questions of us to make sure that we have those, those things lined out. So when we do submit, we have the necessary information. That's it. Thanks very much, Adam. The next thing I'm going to do is just run through some of the frequently asked questions uh, that we've received from uh, the public and other stakeholders throughout this process thus far. So I'm going to ask these questions, then I'm going to lob them across uh, to our panel and they can bounce them around. So the first frequently asked question we've had is how was this site selected? And Saxton, I'm going to look at you firstly for that. I can definitely uh, uh, answer that, but I think Adam is pretty good at articulating this one. Adam, if you want to take that, because that touches on the PLI, B3, something. Sure. So uh, in, in Title 21, we have specific uses, right? And there's and uses are allowed. There's only certain uses that are allowed in certain zoning districts. So for example, um, it's called in Title 21, it's called the Homeless and Transient Shelter. Those are only allowed in two zoning districts in Anchorage. PLI, which stands for Public Lands and Institutions, and the other is B3, which is a version of commercial. And so 
you've already limited the ability of locations to identify. So you, first thing you do is you say, what are the two, lo what are the, where, where are the PLI and the B3 locations in Anchorage? So that's the first thing you ident that we identified. And I will say that the assembly appropriated $200,000 to a term contractor that the municipality uses for, um, to do a site selection. And, and I do, I want to, I think this is important is that when submitting a project for a conditional use, a site selection is not required, but we went ahead and we did that anyways, because we felt as though it was that important. Site selections are not required on projects that require conditional uses, but we did it anyways. We came up with, I think, 150 or more locations that were, were possible. And then there was a host of categories. And so it's not as simple as saying, oh, well, I can see some B3 in this location, or I can see some PLI in this location. There's certain requirements when you have a budding zoning districts, so there's particular setbacks that you have to have. Um, there is a thing such as height restrictions. There's things like lot coverage. There's, there's so many things that you can drill down in in Title 21 to say, sure, this use is allowed, but with the size of the facility that we were doing, well, it won't fit on that lot, or it's a buddy against the residential neighborhood, or there's already a homeless or transient shelter 500 feet away. So there's all these things that you have to take into account, and it's not as simple as just saying PLI or B3. I will say that the report, that site selection study has been on has been online since I think April 20, 26th. Is that correct, Jim? Correct. Yeah, it's been it's been online and available to the public since April twenty sixth. Um, you can you can look at that. You can see the detailed analysis and all the things that were taking place, or all the things that were analyzed in order to find a location. The reason this location worked, um, that we saw we thought this was best, was. Um, Sometimes people think that, oh, you have an existing facility that say is in a B3 area and they, there's already a building on there. You have to understand that when it comes to homeless and transient shelters, there's code requirements for that. So what does it cost to retrofit a build, an existing building? Many times it's more expensive to retrofit an existing building than it is to build a new one. That too was taken into account. Um, in the location that we that was identified, we identified at least five to six million dollars in savings because it already had basically a, a, a pad to build on. There's going to be some modification. There was water, um, water and sewer located there near there. There's power located near there. Um, and as far as that area, that entire lot's about 1.1 million uh, square feet. And even with this additional 27,000 square foot structure, we're nowhere near the lot coverage that is required. So we have plenty of space around there to create buffers, to do to do clearing for fire. Um, it just provided a really good location as well as right across from uh, an existing medical center and um, location to bus routes. So it was really identified to just be a very good location with a tremendous amount of cost savings. And I think that's important to understand is that you have to look and say, how much does it cost to retrofit an existing building? Not only that, but you have to purchase the existing building and the land. So all of those things were taken into an account. I'd like to add that also on the construction side of things, this is most advantageous because the time to do the civil work can quickly eat up your construction season. And because the civil work is already sufficient for the building design, it's really a matter of just striking off the existing asphalt and do some borrowed backfill in some of the areas that haven't been prepped, but we're already turning and burning with all the materials on site once the building arrives. So um, there's a lot of things that make this advantageous to meet the time deadline that we're up against. Again, you know, if there was decisions last year, this project would have been built. And again, there's been a lot of compromises, but you know, with the occupancy uh, being brought down to 150, we've shrank the building. We're still taking advantage of a lot of great things that have already been done. The wetland credits are already being paid for. And we're just, again, our wetland permit with the Corps of Engineers just addressing what was originally intended for that lot, which was, I mean, it was already intended for three different projects. The last most current was the ASD bus farm location. But because that project paid for these wetland credits, this project doesn't have to pay for that. And again, lowers the cost of this project. So the civil work is done, the wetland credits are already paid for and that helps us expedite construction delivery. So 
there's a lot of good things about this project um, in that site. Thanks for explaining that. And Sexton, I'm going to get you to hold the mic because our next question that we have is how will you mitigate fire risk? That's a great question. And uh, it is definitely meeting with a lot of the community councils, uh, the Bachelor Community Council, top of the list, really, I think, said it best that the policy has to support the operations. And uh, I won't forget that. And so it keeps coming up in our design meetings. Again, all concerns are brought to our design team. McCool, Carlson, and Green issues that out to whether it's a civil issue, is it mechanical, is it structural, is it, you know, landscaping. And so it comes up in one of our design meetings and that is that is top of the list. So policy will have to support the operations side, meaning one of the policies being talked about right now is zero tolerance within a mile radius. I think that's going to adjust a little bit as we met with like UAA, for an example, if we did a simple drop of a, uh, of a one mile circumference, that would draw a line through the center of the UAA campus. If we went from the NAV Center out to Northern Lights by Goose Lake Park, I think it's like 1.35. So there might be adjustments to make it a more um, um, site specific uh, delineation using you know, roads, where that line's at. But uh, a lot of good comments have come from meeting with key stakeholders and subject matter experts and everybody. So um, the mitigation techniques right now is a term called firewise, which is limbing the trees down from like eight feet down. That's not defined yet. I don't know if that's six feet. Don't know if that's eight feet yet. Uh, removing the brush and vegetation that's accumulated on the, on, the, on the forest floor. So one, operations can have clear line of sight as they walk the perimeter that we can see through the woods and enforce that zero tolerance of camping. Um, and so a lot of good conversations are happening. You know, we've, adi we've added additional, additional hydrants beyond the requirement. So there's a uh, fire department can hook up at, at, you know, more convenient locations. There's access around the perimeter of the building and the perimeter of the lot. And so uh, a lot of good conversations uh, around uh, fire mitigation. Thanks so much for all of that information. And our next question that we have is for you, Joe. Um, how will loitering and camping be discouraged around the area? Well, this really goes to what Saxton was saying too. We have the we have a zero tolerance plan for certain activities, and it's not just those activities. So the answer to the question is there's several steps to it. One, the navigation center is going to operate 24/7 and be staffed 24/7, and so part of the staff's responsibility will be to mitigate on-site. Um, violations and, and then in the neighborhood the plan through our partners at APD AFD is that we're gonna have zero tolerance for like camping with fires um, as we all know there was a fire in the woods across the street a few years ago that caused a pretty substantial evacuation and so we're not gonna allow those behaviors I mean I think we've all seen it this year at the beetle kill so that's another thing so there's the same bubble that we're talking about we don't know what that looks like right now it, it's something we're working on because as Saxton said, it cuts the UAA campus in half. They don't want anyone starting outdoor fires anywhere on the UAA campus. So even though it seems like an easy thing, that's uh, something we have to work through with UAA because we, while we enforce law on the UAA's campus, they also have their own police department, for instance. So we're working hand in hand with the UAA police to make sure we have the resources, both city and UAA, and we're funding that. So that's something that, because it has an impact on a community partner, we're making sure that you know any of the related costs to uh, some of these, like that abatement of fire, would be provided by the MOA. And um, and then I, I think the other last piece is that. We're going to continue to be a partner through this board. For instance, the community councils all have a seat on the advisory board. So the, it sits basically at the postage stamp. It sits clearly inside one um, you know, community council, but closely abut several others that are highly affected. We've invited all of them to be part of the board. So that's the real piece of this is that they have a direct pipeline to, to get situations remedied, not just before this opens, but the entire time that in the two years that it's going to be operating as a navigation center, they'll have a direct voice to those the resolving situations in case we have something unplanned that comes up. Excellent. And thank you so much for elaborating on the advisory board. Um, Joe, I'm going to keep you in the spotlight for the time being with the questions. Um, what is the long term plan for the navigation center? <clears throat> Well, pursuant to the approval from the assembly, we plan on operating the navigation center um, with a with a dormitory or a, a single male shelter for up to two years. 
the real goal being functional zero. If we can achieve a functional zero, um, we'll close it down early. Of course, we all hope that that's the case. Um, we're on a little bit of a delay getting this open, so um, as Saxton was referring to earlier, so we, we're thinking that's realistic though. Um, the real piece is that the navigation center side, there will always be a need for someone to go down there and get rental assistance, or there will always be a need for someone to come in um, that may be unhoused and get medical. So we envision that the social service side of this, you know, there's really three operations here. We've talked about two, but the third one is when it gets cold, we have a, a statutory duty and code at the health department in Title 16 to provide an emergency warming operation. So this will continue when it gets ultra cold in this town to provide people a place to get out of the weather um, and get a meal. And so, you know, there's always going to be the social service piece, one third of it. In the cold weather, it'll provide us that overflow capacity should they not have a, if they're truly in an unhoused situation or an outside situation to go get warm. And then for the two years that we operate until we get to functional zero, we'll operate the dormitory piece of it. Great, thank you for that. Um, the next question that we've received um, a number of times before is how will clients get to the facility? And how will pedestrians be kept safe? And Saxton, I'm wondering if you can start with that or is that another joke question? I'll start. Um, I think we've talked about these transportation plans. It's in progress. We're waiting for the board to seat. And it really depends on the operations. This may be, you know, we envision that the operator will provide ground transportation as part of the contract. In addition to that, we envision that all the community partners that we currently have, so I'm using the Sullivan operation as a direct comparison. If you've been down there, you'll see that we have minivans, mini buses, uh, like you see anchor rides driving constantly coming in and out. Anchorage Neighborhood Health Centers there are practically every hour on the hour to provide transportation back to Anchorage Neighborhood. Native Health Medical Center sends their about a mid-sized bus down. And so we envision that being a piece of the plan too. We also, uh, as I'll let Saxton speak to, there's a currently an activated uh, people mover stop that's in the process of being reactivated. And then I'll let him speak to the safety parameters he's working with dot NPF uh, for the rest of it, Saxton. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, talking with the, the uh, Alaska State Department of uh, Transportation, Scott Thomas, he's had a lot of continuity with this project. He's been leading back to back uh, last year's project planning. And so one is a traffic analysis assessment of Tudor. And a lot has been publicized about what happens around the mission down at Tudor and Piper in that location. And so because of those stats, we really don't want this to be a, a highlighted you know, hazard section. So it is a absolute definable feature of work in the project planning with the engineering team to mitigate all safety um, um, exposure or hazard exposure to Tudor coming off of the navigation center towards Tudor. That is where we'll channel pedestrian traffic to come out and to, you know, use the overpass or use a long tutor. Um, but again, we want to channel that pedestrian traffic to be as safe as possible. So it's a huge emphasis. The traffic piece, um, there's a hundred vehicle threshold for a traffic analysis assessment. And so uh, we don't anticipate that. I, we don't anticipate uh, 50 vehicles being part of that. So it doesn't trigger some of those assessments. Um, as far as the occupancies and the building operators and everything, but uh, regardless, we are still giving it that that uh, that level of safety and uh, hazard mitigation or you know, planning. So, thank you. Great, thank you uh, to all of you for that information. And just looking out uh, to the crowd we have here this evening, of course, we'll have the opportunity to receive your comments very shortly. Um, first up, I just wanted to share details with you on how you can stay connected with the project team. You can email us on moanavigationcenter at dial.com. And there is also a project website, which is www.moanavigationcenter.com. And there are links on that website uh, to other websites where you'll provide um, see project information provided. In addition, you can find information on the housing and homelessness homepage at muni.org. And we'd like you to complete our online survey, which you can reach by holding up your smartphone to the QR code that's currently displayed on the screen, or that's also available via a link on the project website. So we'll open up the floor for comments shortly. 
Um, but before we do that, I'd like to outline the process that we'll be following to receive comments. If you'd like to comment verbally, please sign up to speak with Jovi and Morgan at the entrance to the room. We'll be giving each speaker three minutes to comment, and there may be responses or follow-ups from the project team. We'll be using a timer so everyone knows how long they have to speak. We'll also receive written comments, and they'll be given equal weight uh, to verbal comments that we receive. In terms of ground rules for making comments, uh, please make sure that you're respectful with your choice of words, your tone, and your volume. Um, we would like just one person at a time to be speaking, and we're mostly asking that so everybody can hear right throughout the auditorium. So please, can you hold off from any side conversations or interrupting the speaker, or I'll have to pull my mum voice out and ask you to quiet down. Uh, we'll be wrapping this meeting up at 7.30 p.m. And I have my first uh, people that have registered as speakers. First up, I'd like to call on speaker number one. Uh, so Ron Aleva, we've got you listed as speaker number one. Um, the speakers are set up just over here on the microphone and I'll just come and check that the volume is turned on. Thank you. And you can't use any four letter words like love, cash, that's being wasted. Hey, I'm Ronald Leva, adjacent to the Brother Francis Shelter for 40 years. I consider myself an expert by experience, education, and the common sense of attending these meetings. Uh, <clears throat> I always feel there's a disturbance in the force when I speak. And I always feel when the speakers up here speak that the hot air isn't outside, it's inside. And this building is going to meet the, in Albuquerque for the regatta. I honestly believe that. Because I heard all this before, 40 years ago. Whether it be the conditional use, don't leave a word of that. Because they're going to go wrong, Joe and their minds are made up. So if you're gonna be affected, any input you have, it's already been decided. So you're stuck. What's missing here is the public trust. This should be filled, but from the previous meetings and the response that happens, like the mediators or the facilitators quitting, they could even get them to agree. And that's sad. Uh, I think it's Congressman Cheney said, when Trump is gone, the dishonor will remain. And the dishonor with members of the assembly using the homeless issue as a political tool against the mayor is shameful. And history will point that out. You're gonna try to minimize the impact uh, I don't think you're going to be able to do that with the circumstances that you said, APD, AFD, the fires, the paramedics. We experienced in 2000, I believe it was 50, 800 calls in three years. I sued them. We mediated. We settled for 30,000. I offered it back to get a a security guard, commercial garbage pickup, and a medic. No one showed up for that money. Three years later, it went to over 15,000 calls. And if it's going to do that, it's going to do that here. And then the advisory board, we have SJ Klein here. We have people on the board. They're not going to listen to the neighbors because they're almost like on a mission from God. So history is going to repeat itself. And as far as the site selection, nonsense. When they rebuilt the Brother Francis shelter, they chose the site where animal control is. And they went with animal control. So in summary, I, I like all of you. 
And I think you're trying to do the right thing, but that's not going to work. Uh, you're almost on the path to failure, and it's going to be very expensive and not successful. Um, you can ask me a question as an expert, and so I'm open to that. And uh, do you have any? You know why? Because your mind's already made up. And we're stuck with whatever you I'm give us. I'm going to cut you off now. Oh, thank, you thank you so much for oh, your comments. You're more than welcome. I always like the hot air coming out of this body because I can navigate a hot air balloon. All right. Thank you. Okay, um, Annie, are you sure? <laughs> we're stuck. Who's the next speaker? I'll pass it on. Great. Speaker number two is Jason. Thank you, Jason. Good evening. Vivid security. Vivid security. And the homeless shelter going up in two hundred now, where you're saying it is 150 with room for expansion. For the last that I heard, yes. Okay. That was a recording of someone that's profiting off the east side now, using the shelter to profit. He doesn't even live in this city. He's from Vegas. The last one was from Florida. He's coming around. He's using the fear of the shelter and what it's not going to be, which we know and Ron has just said. And I would like to know, is there going to be truly an expansion beyond the 50 beds? Because at this point, this shelter and the way that everything has been going, this bait and change that's been going on for this process, right? Be truthful with us. Because you guys will be gone in three years. This isn't going to happen in two years, right? Functional zero is not really zero, everyone. If you haven't reviewed that, it's not true zero. We will never meet that, right? So truthfully, this man is profiting off us. The corridor that is set, one mile is not enough. It needs to be two. So I missed, and I apologize for missing, I was trying to get here. We missed, I missed the, what you guys said about that. However, again on the radius, make sure that that is expanded, right? The cards that were sent out didn't make it to anyone about the permitting meeting, right? Made it to you, Saxon, right? You admit it, made it to your office, but it didn't make it anywhere else. There's Greenbrier Apartments, there's 195 units in there. There's La Casa Blanca, there's about 20 units there, right? Did it make it to just them? Because it made it nowhere else in the neighborhoods. Did it make it to AMC and everybody in their offices? So whatever 175 cards that went out to notify people did not notify the right people that are truly going to be affected by the shelter. You guys are shortchanging us and it's BS. I'm sorry to be, if you want to give me the mom voice, but we don't appreciate it. There hasn't been transparency. It's in the media, we already knew it. Right? Your boss, you're standing behind him. That's fine. So I Ron, I disagree with you on this. The mayor has not been truthful, right? That's my opinion. And we'll come out to find later on that this shelter was a deal in hand, either by word or by handshake, with uh what is it, sprung when Dr. Morris was in effect and he was in the position. It will come out at some point, not at this point. Probably not in the near future, but it will come out. Someone's going to put effort toward it, and they're going to find out. It's not a threat, but we know it, right? We're getting this, as Ron said. However, there's very strategic things that need to be happening, right? I missed the bus passes, but how much is that going to cost? Because I don't remember seeing that, and I may have missed it in the overall presentation that happened in the special presentation. I'll email you guys the rest of my question. Thank you. Thanks very much. And just for everyone's awareness, um, and those of you that did come late to the meeting, we are recording the presentation that we did tonight and the remainder of the meeting, and they will be available on the Muni's website tomorrow, so you'll have the opportunity uh, to listen in retrospect. Speaker number three is Jim. Oh, you didn't want to try the last name. No. <laughs> My name is Jim Wojciechowski. Uh, pretty much everybody sitting up there knows who I am. I'm uh, president of the Basher Community Council. Um, I've been paying close attention to this. Our community council passed a resolution uh, before I was elected opposing the location of 
this uh, math center and shelter for some very obvious reasons. You've already mentioned probably the number one reason, and it's fire. Um, yeah, I think you're probably about five and a half to six miles away from us. But as Saxon and I were talking about before this even started, all it takes is a northeasterly wind and one homeless camp and stuck against in trouble. We have one egress, one only. I've worked my butt off for the last eight weeks after I got elected to try to find another way out of there. And uh, the previous president told me, you're never going to find one. Uh, I don't usually believe things unless I stumble into it myself. I reached out to people at J-Bear. I tried to find another egress route out through their land or their, our northern border. And uh, the tank trail that used to run through there used to have a nice little bridge, actually a fairly large bridge, that went across the north branch of Campbell Creek. It would have been a great way to get out if we had to get out. Uh, that bridge is gone. There's now literally a four-wheeler footpath across it with locks, and you're not going to get across there. You could walk across. But I also guarantee you that the majority of people that live in Stuck Again are like everybody else in the Anchorage Bowl. They probably don't have a go bag next to their door ready to bail. You know, that's a personal responsibility thing that people need to do. And I'll do everything I can to educate my community about that. The one thing I do want to thank you for, though, is uh, I attended the Campbell Park Community Council Zoom meeting. I've been to a couple of these already. And you keep mentioning Basher Community Council and that single egress road. So I guess maybe my ability to be a squeaky wheel is working a little bit from that standpoint. You know we're there. And we're going to do everything we can on our end to make it a safe place to live. But again, one homeless camp, one fire out of control, northeasterly wind, and we have a real problem. I spoke with the uh, station chief at station 14, asked him pragmatically, you know, what are you guys gonna be able to do if we have a wildfire burning through there? I mean, what if it engulfs the road, you can't even get trucks up? And he said, well, you know, that I'm, I'll paraphrase. There's a bigger problem. We don't have fire hydrants up there. Uh, the initial truck on scene will have 11,000 gallons of water. That's 10 minutes. A tanker truck will be 10 minutes behind it. Okay. It's an ugly picture if this ever goes down. I just want to keep reminding you of that. I'll work with any of you to find solutions. I'm happy to. Any questions for me? Thanks, folks. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, and our next speaker, number four, is S.J. Klein. Great. Thank you. Uh, nice to see you, Renee. S.J. Klein, uh, Vice President of Fairview Community Council, Chair of the Homelessness, Housing, and Neighborhood Development Commission, uh, also Chair of the Fairview Business Association. Um, the first issue that I'd like to bring up, which is not specific to the Nav Navigation Center, but um, more specific to the mass care exit strategy and as it relates to the opening of this is that there's a big gap right now in some of the paperwork that you've, that you've offered here today between the closing of the shelter that exists at Sullivan and the opening of things like the navigation center. Um, the plan from everybody up the chain that I've spoken to is it's summer, we don't need to worry about it, um, which doesn't impact the budget of the municipality, but it definitely impacts property owners around places where uh, people in need of services congregate. Um, you know, personally, I'm having to clean up a lot more feces, needles, kick drug dealers off of my properties and, and the properties around uh, other property or owners around my facility or just up from the Sullivan Arena. So there's a big gap right now between when this finally opens and what's happening until then. Um, a gap in services for people, also a gap in just managing a population that, you know, there's just health and safety issues up the wazoo. And what my experience has been is when you leave a population without services and without oversight, bad things happen. They end up worse, worse outcomes. Uh, instead of getting more towards a functional zero, you're getting toward, more towards a functional 100. Um, some items specific to 
the navigation center, um, one on the site plan selection. I will say I don't think being next to the police is really an issue. The experience of downtown has been that having a police department there, ADP decided to get rid of security and the security ambassadors, um, which I think has resulted in a lot worse uh, homeless issues and, and people in downtown. Um, so I, the police really aren't there to stop people from living and, you know, I mean, Camps, yes, but uh, you know you can't get rid of camps if you don't have places for them to go, um, and that's where kind of the size issue and the number of other facilities that are online uh, are really insufficient for the population that's out there. Um, I did have a question, and it's mostly related to the offsite impacts. Uh, when you have a facility, there's always people that are going to congregate. The bigger the facility is, the more people are going to congregate. That maybe aren't coming in for services, either because they want to keep partying or because they can't come in because they've been banned or who knows what. Um, and so my question relates to the 24 seven services that you're offering. Does that mean that you're not going to have a curfew? Uh, does that mean people are after curfew, if you do have a curfew that you're planning on having another place for them like you did at the Sullivan over the winter with the warming hut? Um, because that will really have an impact on what happens outside the facility. Thanks very much, Is Our next speaker, number five, is Kath. Kate. Kate. Try your feet. Uh, good evening. I'm Kate, and I've lived here in Anchorage going on 12 years, mainly in the Midtown area. I've been to several of these farms, uh, very interested in the issue of homelessness. Uh, I'll make a comment first and then a question. Uh, I've been here over the 12 years and have seen the homeless uh, issue, uh, people sleeping in the streets, uh, in the park areas. I've seen a great deal of uh, intoxication spread out all over Midtown, uh, in the library area especially. And so I'm wondering if, I mean, as the elected executives come and go, the mayor's office, uh, new people are replaced uh, each election almost. And so it just seems like for every two steps forward, you're going three steps back. Um, so I'm wondering if this is no longer just an Anchorage problem and it hasn't been for years. I see this more as a state problem. Over half of the state legislators live in Anchorage all the way up to Wasilla. And it would seem that with that kind of political clout that the Anchorage administration and the assembly should be reaching out to their elected officials that serve in state government and find out what kind of funding, what kind of state resources can be uh, put in the kitty to help reduce this issue of uh, what's going on with homeless populations. And that's my comment. State involvement versus just Anchorage doing it alone. Um, I also have a deep concern because I am a uh, customer owner, user of the services at the South Central uh, campus with the Alaska Native Medical Center. And I know there's a fair amount of activity of the addiction population uh, that gets taken over to the emergency room because I've been there. I've even taken and escorted some of the homeless that were in critical uh, shape, and I got them to the emergency room on my own volunteer time and dine. And so I'm wondering, has this been an issue with the Alaska Native uh, campus, the medical campus, and the concerns that how much is this uh, moving and setting up the navigation center across the highway from the Native Hospital? What is the, the impact going to have on uh, the healthier use of that emergency room in the medical center versus now bringing in all these uh, people with chronic medical problems, addiction? How big of an impact is that going to have on our, camp, our medical campus? Has that been addressed? I haven't heard it. The question brought up uh, here at any of your forums. Thank you, Kate. I'll answer. Great. 
Well, I said amateur team. We have some amateurs for you, but we have a lot of questions. We're going to go ahead and answer them. We don't want to cut anyone off if we start answering someone who wants to speak. So. Well, you can say yes, no. Has it been addressed? All right, I would like to invite speaker number six to come up, um, Stephen. I'm Stephen Callahan from the UMED. Good to see everyone again. Uh, just want to clarify, this is the conditional use permit meeting. Okay. He said notices out to everyone within how many feet? Five hundred. Five hundred feet. Okay. That's not a lot of people that notices were sent to. Just letting you know that. Um, it would be nice to made that a bit wider, bigger radius. Um, Usual questions, Saxton, do we have a guaranteed maximum price? We do. Okay. Uh, any changes to the site plan the last meeting and this meeting? No, no changes to the site plan. Still 35%? 65% now. 65%? Will mm -hmm. those plans be available to look at? Yes, they're on the website link that uh, Dallas provided. The okay. current, the current, current plans. Okay. All right. Um, can you start the utility work yet? Uh, those conversations are ongoing with NSTAR and GH. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Of course, being living in the UMED, we are concerned about the impacts to the neighborhood on that facility. They potentially have, in my view, that we do have a lot of pedestrian deaths on Tudor Road. Corner of right the tutor has been brought up with DOT. Um, yeah, the same questions I had last time, you know, should be addressed. Has an operations plan been brought forth, created? Are you still in an RMP process for that? The operations plan's in, uh, in development right now. Okay. Okay. We brought on a consultant for doing that, or? Um, we are. We are currently in the process of, of looking for a consultant. Are you to, to create the operations plan, or are you referring to a subject matter expert? Well, I'm assuming subject matter expert would be the Anchorage Coalition for the Homeless. And you would not, that would not be. The Anchorage Coalition and Homelessness, all a very valuable tool, has zero experience actually operating a navigation center, so the MOA is currently out soliciting a subject matter expert that has at least five years of experience running a navigation center. The coalition is obviously actively involved, but that is not the SME that we're referring to. Okay, okay, so you're gonna have, you're gonna have a, essentially an RFP out for, or RFI out for someone that has that. That is correct. Okay, gotcha, all right. And then you'll work on the operations plan at that time. The operations plan and it are, some pieces are in play. I mean, there's, it's yeah. a very large project, so yep. yes. Okay. All right, this is all my, all my questions for you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I'd like to invite speaker number seven now, Annette. Good evening, my name is Annette Aleva. Um, Ron is my husband. As he says it, when he introduces me, this is my first wife. Annette, I will say this is my last husband. And he usually gets a laugh, so it tells me. Well, I don't come to a lot of these things, frankly, because it wasn't quite 40 years of being next to the Brother Francis shelter, but it, it certainly seemed like this. 10 years ago, we moved to Midtown, Rogers Park, and within the last week or two, overflow people from probably uh, the Sullivan Arena or the neighborhood there increasingly have come into my neighborhood, have engaged in illegal activity, have necessitated phone calls to the police. This is Rogers Park, okay? <laughs> COVID happened and the homeless were moved in closer to an area where I moved partly to get away from this. 
I had lived this for so long, and it's been not only a family, a business, a whatever. Um, I write for the Catholic Anchor. I don't know if I do anymore. A lot of changes there. I have been this sort of cognitive dissonance of supporting, understanding, interviewing people who are actors, uh, going to meetings like this, um, conditional use with the very people that I was also writing about. It's been very difficult for me, and so I tend to stay away. But I'm concerned about this. I'm concerned about the future of our city, and I'm concerned about exactly what uh, guarantees whatever's in place. I did, I did write down some notes. The gentleman who talked about fire, concern. Um, shortly after, well, in 2000, when was the Sockeye fire? Um, the, the woods were lit on fire behind my house. I lived close to the Chester Creek Green Valley. Interestingly enough, I live on Harlow Street. <laughs> and we've been at this for a long time. That's the least of your worries in, in some sense. Not to say that fire isn't a concern, but rapes, assaults, drug use, illegal drug use. The SJ mentioned the more unpleasant aspects of having people near a facility if they're not. Now you say you're going to have all these things in place, and as Ron said, we asked for them over and over and over. We even sued to get them, and we never did. <sighs> The incursion into the neighborhoods. You need to be concerned about this. We are recommended to put no trespassing signs on our own property to keep people from, from coming, entering into it. And the last thing I want to say is when COVID happened in May of 2020, a woman who probably was homeless, we never thought about, certainly had some mental health issues, came into my home, made herself comfortable on my couch, ate food out of my refrigerator. At first I thought she was a friend of my daughter's, so my daughter went up there to deal with her, took a knife, the police came, she was arrested. I don't want this to happen to any of you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite speaker number eight, Jen. You'll probably sound a lot of repetitive stuff from the people who spoke before. I hadn't intended to say anything, uh, but I'm so disappointed in this process that it's, it actually, I, I don't even have words for how betrayed I feel by this process. I live less than a mile away from where the facility is gonna be. And I started attending my community council meetings kind of spurred on to learn more about this. And I remember the first um, homeless coordinator, the um, anesthesiologist at a, meet, at a meeting, he briefly attended saying, no, I wouldn't want this in this neighborhood. He, nobody ever came to our, you know, nobody asked. There was no public, like you all might think that you tried to solicit public opinion, but you know, I have to dig to find this information. And my number one concern is fire. I was in 2019 evacuated from one of those neighborhoods when that fire happened in July. And you can say you only need to notify people 500 feet, 500 feet, 500 yards away. Well, a fire, if it had been windy that day, sure would have moved a lot faster than 500 feet, 500 yards away from that facility. And it takes, just like that one gentleman said, one single homeless camp fire and you know, I don't know if it's going my direction, somebody else's direction. It's it just seems like a bonkers place to have a facility that is essentially next to the largest unoccupied park in Anchorage. What's four four hundred acres, four thousand acres? I don't know. I didn't look it up, but it's huge. You could also, uh, like the last speaker just said, if people come to congregate around that facility but are not staying there. You could have people lost in that woods. We lost, you know, what was it? That rodeo cow got lost in the woods and never found. What if that was you were, you know, maybe a homeless person, but that homeless person is your mom or your daughter or your brother. People could go out of there and all kinds of bad things could happen. And I just think it is a bonkers location. I know it's already been decided. Uh, that's vastly disappointing to me. I would think that, um, I would think that there would be more care for public opinion. But yeah, I, if there was a fire there and it burned down houses, people, 
that's all that's on you guys or who's ever doing this but thank you thank you for your comment i'd like to invite now speaker number nine leah Well, I actually disagree with most of the people I've heard speak in general. Um, I think Tudor and Elmer is a great place for a location for a homeless shelter. Um, I do live nearby, and I've I've lived I grew up in Anchorage, and this has been a problem my whole life. I don't ever want to see or hear about anyone freezing to death again. And this is why I'm the most upset is that I've heard the shelter was supposed to be much bigger. And I'm really upset that they've made it smaller because of, and I don't understand why everyone wants a smaller shelter because we need enough space. Right now, the Sullivan Arena is housing almost 500 people. And the plan that I'm currently looking at here doesn't have 500 people, a, a place for 500 people to stay. And I think that's outrageous because we need a place for all of our homeless people to shelter at night. And I don't care whether they're drug dealers or whether they are drug addicts. I think that everyone should have a place to sleep so they, they can stay warm. I've seen people sleeping in, in the cold and I just can't believe it. They have frostbitten on their toes and on their fingers and they can't use their hands and feet anymore. And now they're disabled. So, I mean, even more disabled than they were before when a lot of them were already disabled in various different ways. I, um, yeah, so that's pretty much most of what I have to say that I'm really upset that the shelter is now planned to be much smaller. And I thought that we should actually have something bigger, more like a thousand place, like a, a thousand bed facility, so that there would be enough for in case anyone had an emergency that they would have a place to stay. And if we had a larger facility, we could have places for women, we could have places for couples and families and all of that. And and I, that's what I was really hoping for, that we would have a really large facility, and we can still have smaller facilities. Because if, and also, bus passes are pretty expensive, and, and um, a lot of times the shelters are not actually giving those bus passes out as much as we're all saying that they do. That's not entirely true. Um, there's a lot of people that are walking everywhere they need to go. And that's, that's one of the problems with the location, is that there, there is walking distance to places that they would need to go or want to go. Um, but I <laughs> I think that there would need to be some kind of shuttle service because if you're walking all the way to Tudor and you don't have a place to stay once you get there, you're going to be turned out into the cold again. And that's what's going to happen with all the little shelters. If you have someone walking all the way there, hoping that they'll have a bed for the night, maybe they prefer a certain shelter and then they don't have a bed for the night, what are they supposed to do? If, especially if it's curfew time, like where are they supposed to go at the curfew time? Um, I think there should be shuttle services so that they can get to, to where they're needing. And certainly taxis would be a lot more expensive. Taxi vouchers are a lot more expensive than shuttles would be. And it seems like there would be need to call or whether there's space at a place. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. I'd like to invite speaker number 10 to come up now, Ian. Uh, hello, my name is Ian Blake. Um, I'm a resident of the university area. Um, appreciate you guys coming out on a gorgeous uh, summer evening. Um, I'll echo a lot of the disappointment. Uh, I think that as someone, uh, as someone that's a stakeholder resident, um, there's been a real lack of transparency throughout this process uh, from the design, site selection. Um, we had a mayor that came in uh, with this plan ready to build uh, on July 1st of last year, um, somehow uh, already with contracts in place uh, with strong structures. Um, not under the municipality, but uh, with previous uh, previous homeless director um, personally paying for uh, the design cost, um, and I just think uh, it's this has been a frustrating, disappointing process. I've been to a lot of these. Um, very few details. I expect as the project progresses, we get more details, more input, um, and all I see are kind of the same repackaged slides. Uh, describing something um, that isn't really feasible. I mean, I, we talked about this uh, at the last conditional use. Um, 
hearing uh, where I wanted to know how you're actually going to prevent people from camping and from loitering and do these things. Uh, this remediation that you're promising to the community, um, but isn't legal if there's not shelter space or, um, you know, there's a 10 day, uh, 10 day camp abatement process. Um, you can't just sort of, you know, where's the line between someone sitting on a bench, um, recreating on a trail, uh, and exploring and enjoying nature and loitering or camping or having a fire or, um, you know, all those sorts of things. So um, I really, really, really hope that uh, as part of this process, um, the city invests in more treatment, um, more housing, uh, that this isn't just, okay, we built this thing, it's over, um, we need to have places to navigate people too, um, and we need to have treatment options for people. Uh, I suggested that uh, at a couple of these um, in my public comments, but I really do hope that the city uh, continues to invest, um, or does, and then continues to invest in uh, treatment options for people that serve a uh, homeless population, uh, as well as um, people, other people that are struggling with substance use uh, disorders. Um, so uh, thank you for your time, uh, and appreciate you being here. Thank you, Ian. So we have just over 20 minutes, no, sorry. Um, We've got close to an hour remaining of our time. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to our panel. Um, as Joe mentioned, we've got some responses to some of the comments that were made this evening. If you do wish to make a comment and haven't done so thus far, uh, please do pop out and see Jovi, um, and she'll get you signed up to make a comment. So I'll hand over now to John Sexton. Great, thank you. Uh, Jason and, and Ron, there's a, a gap that I can bridge there with you guys that um, I think one example I would say we are not fixed in these decisions. We are, we are here to hear what the public wants. Again, we've got a lot of great comments from uh, you know these, uh, I think our favorite meetings I've been a part of were the community council meetings with the different groups um, because it's very close to the area and there's a lot of residents that uh, contribute to that conversation. But to answer your question, Jason, uh, I think one thing to watch is the policy. Again, it, policy has to support the operations. And I don't know what that looks like as far as that one mile radius, but that's a great the final feature to watch that, that will change. I, I anticipate that, you know, reaching out beyond that one mile. I don't know what it is right now, but after that one meeting with UAA, it, you know, it's drawing that right through the campus. That doesn't work. Um, that, you know, that puts enforcement on UAA and really you know, blurs the line between APD, our, our on-campus operations personnel and UAA police. So watch that one feature for changes because that's just a good one to see how that you know, is gonna adjust based off of all the different groups. And I would think that probably blends into Joe's uh, group that will make these decisions where there's representatives from each community council and the other uh, you know, SMEs, or your SME that you're seeking and others, but I'll let Joe kind of uh, close on that item. Thanks, and to Jen's point, um, if you were out at that fire, I was the one that had the school open where you came down to, um, you know, when it was shelter time. So I can tell you that it isn't, I mean, I agree 100% with Jen. Um, fire is a danger all the time. And I, I heard you know, a couple people in here mention a homeless person camping. It could be the reckless neighbor. I've had it in my neighborhood, I live up the hillside, and I've had people recklessly burning and um, almost burn my fence down, wood fence. So I think that this is a concern citywide, and you've seen that we had an emergency ordinance around reckless burning. Um, we continue to have a code change around that. And so we didn't have that tool two months ago, and it has nothing to do with homelessness. It had to do with the fire danger across the city. So I think everyone's taking it more seriously from the Ready, Set, Go program being kind of beefed up. You may not see some of these things. So, I mean, this, this project, um, I hear a lot of that it's predetermined. This has had an impact on the city that I think is beyond just what's happening at Tudor and Elmore. And so, um, you know, the fire danger, I mean, if you watched the news the other night, uh, Parks and Rec was out cutting the heck out of beetle kill trees all over, trying to re resurrect some old natural and man-made fire breaks. So I, I really think that this has stimulated a conversation. So yes, the Basher Community Council should have a concern. I mean, stuck again, Heights Road, uh, 
on an icy day is, is just as bad as maybe fire day, you know? So I, I feel for your situation up there, but let me say that no one's taking this lightly. I mean, we have asked AFD, for instance, to come down with every possible suggestion. And, um, you know, through Saxton's group, they're looking at all those options. I don't know. We're not the fire department, we're the health department, but I can tell you that this isn't a matter of, we're gonna put up a little bubble and say we did what was required. We presented this AO and the EO to the assembly and we had partners on the assembly, I think passed unanimously. So that gives you the kind of determination in the city to correct some of the, you know, bigger issues. That wasn't just a homeless issue, that was a fire danger and Anchorage issue. And so I'll just use that one. Um, and I can answer some of the questions. Do you wanna go back? I'll let Adam jump in too. Yeah, I, I just want to address, because I've heard this multiple times, that, you know, sending out the notices 500 feet. You know, we, we're bound by the code. The, the code requires us 500 feet. So that's that's what we have to do. It's not an arbitrary, well, actually, to be honest with you, it was under the old code, Title 21, it's under the new code, Title 21, 500 feet. That's what we're bound by, that's what we do. Um, we meet the code. Um, where the 500 feet came from, I have no idea. If, if that's if we don't like 500 feet, my suggestion: talk to assembly members. They're responsible for the code. If it should be a thousand feet, 1500 feet, 15 miles, you know, lobby your assembly member to to expand that. But I just want to emphasize that we are bound to do what the code says, and and that was our requirement, and we are we have to fulfill that requirement. Adam, I appreciate, I, don't want to, I appreciate what you said. However, we're here tonight and you guys are trying to rezone, right? No, no, we're not We're not rezoning anything. A rezone requires a 500 foot notice as well. A rezone is a completely different process. But we're looking to make some changes, right? You guys have made changes. In the overall plan, I'm not saying this in general for this meeting, right? So why would you know it? If there's more people out there, why would you put that in? Well, I can answer that, Jason. Okay. So this is a great thing because we set a precedent. So if, if, if we establish a precedent, and that's why we're recommending the correct answer is a code change. And so the reason I say that is, what happens the next time somebody wants to open a marijuana store and we say 500 feet isn't enough? So one of the things that our lawyers really advise us is to stick with code because, because we create a precedent. And you can say, well, that's what the city did. They went to two miles of mailing postcards around the navigation center. We're moving in, just so you know, we're moving into a shelter licensing process, right? Like it was passed in code and it, can, it starts January 1, you know, to some of the problems Ron had. And so the, the assembly saw that and created this code and code is designed to be flexible if that isn't enough distance. And again, that's the piece. For instance, what I'd like to point out, and Adam's probably gonna get mad at me here is that that we never did a CUP process around the soul then, right? And those people probably deserve the same opportunity. Ron probably would have liked to see UP process around uh, Brother Francis, maybe. You know, that was 40 years ago, as he likes to point out. But I think the piece that we really look at from a municipal standpoint is once we do something, whether it's required or not, we've established a pattern, and that pattern then becomes expected. And so while we hear what you're saying, absolutely. Um, you know, the real answer is they need to change that. And the same thing around other things in code about sheltering. We have emergency cold weather sheltering in the code. That's it for the health department. If they want to expand that, the assembly knows very well as the legislative branch how to change that. So I just wanted to mention that. It's not that we're not sympathetic to what everyone's saying here, but once we start down the road, when government goes and does something, it becomes um, a standard. All right, I'm just gonna pause the uh, question responses. We've had two more commenters sign up, so I'll um, let people speak and then we'll come back to the panel. I'd like to invite uh, speaker number 11, uh, Josette, uh, to come and stand up and speak. Yes, this point, $2 million I'm sleeping in the car. I'm sleeping in the car. Yeah, $6.2 million. You wanna feel something while well, I sleep in the car? I came to sleep in the park but every other day somebody was calling and, and the park people were coming away and moved move to where? Move to where? There's nowhere for me to move to. And if I don't hurry up and take the tent down and get my belongings because I cannot carry on my own, then I'm threatened with the police. That's number one. Number two, Meg's Hotel used to be my, my child's foster placement. 
And she has gone around to every agency and told them not to help me. Why is OCS Meg Patel allowed to run the city? I got six medical conditions that qualify for SSI. They, they got nine all together. I got six of them and still can't do it. That's all I gotta say. I gotta get back to my stuff before it's gone. Ma'am, ma'am. Ma'am, we have camping for you. That. I don't want to hear. I okay, that. goodbye. Because this Sorry. makes no sense. You got $6.2 million right now. Put us in housing now. You don't need a new navigation center and a new shelter. That's for, that's for planning to have a, a homeless crisis. You don't have a homeless crisis in Alaska. You got a corruption problem in the age. That's what you got to watch. You heard from her. She's right. All right. I'm going to invite speaker number 12 to come up now. Sherry? Yes. I'm Sherry Neff, and thank you for being here tonight. Um, I, it was mentioned that perhaps managers from Houston or Charleston might come and manage here. My concern is that this structure is for warmer climates, and it sounds like it's not set yet as to how this structure would withstand the cold, the extremes in temperature, the snow load, the earthquake. Um, challenge what's the insulation value, the cost of heating. So that's just a question I have out there. Thank you. Just have one more speaker sign up, so we'll let our commenters stand up. Um, Katie, I would like to invite you to the microphone. Hi, my name is Katie Gibson, and I live pretty close, I'd say probably within two miles of the um, navigation center plans here. Um, I've been a resident of, of Alaska for a very long time, and I get super nervous when I speak. Um, while um, I appreciate the efforts of the city, of you folks, of the assembly, the municipality, to help the homeless issue that we have, and it's ever growing, especially the problem of the um, the chronic public inebriates, those are what I would like to see the city target the most as priority. And I would just wonder where, um, who are the clientele that this navigation center is actually focusing on? Um, because I don't see like somebody down on, um, say, Benson Boulevard, that whole group of people that hang out there, and an uh, ever growing group of people over by the bar there by Walmart and Fred Meyer, there's just a huge group of people over there. I don't think those people would qualify to come to the navigation center. So what are we going to do to target helping those people? Treatment, right here, treatment first. If they, if they, if they, um, I guess I would want to ask, does the navigation center require sobriety? Do people have to be sober and not using when they're coming in for services? How is that going to be achieved so people can come and use these services? That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. All right, I'm going to look back to uh, the team now to continue with answering questions. Again, a reminder, if you would like to speak, please do sign up. We do have time. So I did record what everyone said, and I'm going to try to answer as many questions in the time that allows. And as we said, we did record it, and we'll try to get a lot of these questions also answered on our uh, dedicated web page that you saw. So, we started talking about the fire danger being a citywide problem, and, and we are 100% in agreement on that. And it doesn't have to do with just homeless people and camping, it has to do with reckless burning, and we are addressing that. So I'll stop there on that. Um, um, I did want to correct something. Um, during the transportation plan, we have no intention of just distributing bus passes. We have found that that is uh, not always the best program, having a focused transportation like the minibus that's a service to and from a, a client. And that way they have dual service. One of the things we found is by just giving them a bus pass that they end up you know, getting distracted from the option. So putting them on a bus and sending them for medical treatment, when they're done the treatment, they come out and they're returned to the navigation center is a much more positive way to, to provide services. And so um, 
That's the plan. And the transportation plan has many pieces. Most of the medical providers, uh, the larger medical providers, have a transportation because this is common. Take Native. They have people that fly into town, the Native Medical Center, and they don't need to get them from those hotels in. And so we have been working with them. I heard a question about are we working with Native? The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, we have a significant portion of the current clientele of the, uh, particularly the Sullivan Arena, receive services from the Native Medical Center. So we've already had that. Uh, that is an existing operation that will transfer over to the new navigation center. Um, you know, but to uh, Sherry's point and, and, and Katie, some of the questions really come back to the operations and, and we're looking at those things. You know, I'll let's on, on your main question, Sherry, about the structure, Saxton definitely has the answers. These things are way up even on the North Slope, and I'll let him get into the details, but this wasn't something that we just kind of willy-nilly picked. Um, and it has to comply, and I'll let Adam speak to that. But I'm going to speak to the programmatic pieces um, around some of the, uh, the questions directly. Um, you know, the answer is yes to some of the questions. Do we plan on having uh, up-level enforcement? Yes. Is it going to be a no barrier shelter? No. Can somebody come and it? Yes. That doesn't mean we're going to allow them to assault somebody there. That would not, that would be a barrier, right? You can't physically assault somebody and stay in the shelter because it, we have to protect the people that can't protect themselves. Now we understand that somebody that's inebriated, they need shelter too. In fact, it's easier to freeze to death when you don't have that ability to notice that you're getting cold, right? And so that is something that we're looking at. The answer is, will they be able to come and go all night? The answer is yes, we receive people currently at the Sullivan. Do we let them disrupt the bunk room area, the dormitory? No, we're gonna have as you, if we were to put up on the slide, the, uh, the floor plan, you'll be able to see there's a center there where we're gonna have them. So if they arrive at midnight or one, dropped off by PD from somewhere cold, which currently happens regularly, as you see, um, there's a area and, and this, this brown area here is a kitchen. And then what we say the dining room, but that doubles as the waiting to go into the dormitory on the right hand side that's blue. So the answer is no, we're not going to turn them away because it's 10.01 and we've locked the door and you're turned away. The staff will receive you. You know, there will be limited services at 11 a.m., uh, sorry, 11 p.m. or midnight, but you're not getting turned away. And so I do want to note that because that comes up regularly because the last thing we want is someone to get transported by APD who's a partner with us. Um, and we look at that. To answer the question, unfortunately, she left just today, Centennial Park. We have people staying there. We're not we're not abating people in Centennial Park. So I note that because, you know, one of the things that comes up is abatement. I don't have a role in abatement, but I can tell you I, I've been here a long time in the city. It's a hot button. There's two abatements. You have your standard abatement that's a 10 day abatement. Then we have an emergency abatement. So this is a high fire danger. Somebody's camping in the middle of the of the beetle kill cut down that Saxton's teams have gone out. No, sorry, it's Parks and Rec actually. But if somebody had a campsite inside of the beetle kill down timber, we'd move them right along. And that's an exemption to Boise for a public safety emergency. But we're not looking to abate camps just because we have a problem with somebody complaining. The camp abatements right now are highly focused. And so I don't have a role in that, but I can tell you as a resident, I keep an eye on it. And one of the things we are looking at is for those high fire danger is it's not a 10 day abatement. It's a pretty spontaneous, maybe there's some rules, but it's not, we just don't like, oh, let's, let's hope he doesn't burn anything for nine and a half days. We absolutely are very actively involved in abating those high danger situations. Um, I'm just looking at some of the. Yeah, why don't you speak to the R value? Um, I can answer the R value and the building efficiency um, concern. Uh, I guess top of the list would be the snow load calculation for the for the structure. That structure is used on the North Slope. Uh, North Slope in British Columbia are probably the best examples of its of its success in those regions. That was a big concern initially from us as well. Now remember, we put out the RFP. You know, when I was asked uh, to be a part of this after the John Morris effort, months after, you know, he, you know, he had left and then I was uh, asked to be, you know, to, to kind of lead the team. And then just formally, I was introduced as the project manager. I, it was, you know, when I told all involved at the executive, uh, the executive team in the assembly, say it won't be us that tells us what, uh, tells, you know, decides what type of building this will be. 
We are the owner, the customer. In the end, we put our needs out there and the construction industry will tell us what we need. Now, I was fearful that in the end, we were going to get a similar result with the planning projections. We were going to get a pre-engineered membrane structure. And that's what we got. So it still proved that, that the previous project planning was successful to an extent, but it also eliminated the brick and mortar, the, the engineered steel uh, SIPs, the structurally insulated panels, the different building methods were not proposed in the proposals we received from contractors. So it was interesting that the two proposing contractors did spec out a membrane structures, you know, exactly what we're getting now. So that, that was kind of one clue. And really, I think what dictated this building system was the timeline. It is the most, it's the fastest solution to the timeline. And that's why we got what we got. Um, the R value is surprisingly uh, uh, an efficient uh, build. Um, it's the walls and the ceilings is an R30 R value. And uh, the building, the mechanical system I, is not been set in stone yet. We're at 65%. So I couldn't speak to exactly to the heating method. I know some other building operators on the slope. I know some of their fit efficient systems are uh, using recycled. Well, the, the oil from equipment is sent to a refinery where they clean the oil and they use that in a heating system. So they reuse their oil in a drip system. And it's actually very efficient there. Um, and it reduces the waste and all that. So that's something to be optimistic about. The municipality currently uses that in one of their other facilities. So that's good. Um, but the, I know the snow load, this building doesn't carry a load, it sheds it. And so that's one of the strategies there. But in addition, it, it meets those requirements. I can speak to the design meet. We met with the, our, our design team, McCool Carlson and Green, and uh, our whole um, team of engineers, structural, uh, mechanical, civil, we all met with the building services department to put our plan in front of them finally. They usually don't like to look at it until you get to 95%. We needed to be more reassured at this phase. And so we put that plan in front of them. Uh, there's lots of other conversations that have happened between the engineering teams to one-off you know, uh, engineers at the meeting, but the whole team was put in front of them last week and we got a preliminary reassurance that the design criteria that we're designing to is satisfactory will be MOA building code. So that was that was reassuring. So Adam, I'm not keeping you from jumping in or anything. Do you need no you you had asked about wind and seismic and in order to build in, in order to get your certificate of occupancy, it, it has to pass all that plan review, fire review, zoning, address, if there's MPDES any sort of short program, all those things have to be addressed. Um, you know, when you look at, you know, certain particulars are gonna be looked at, um, like what's the wind zone area for this, for this, and it's gonna have to be rated to the highest that's in, in different areas of the city have been classified as far as their highest wind zone. You know, up on a flat top area, that's the highest one, that's like 110, 100, 160, I think, maybe. Down here, it's, it's a little bit lower in this location. You're going to look at seismic zone. Is it a seismic zone four? Is it a seismic zone one? Is it a seismic zone zero? Whatever that seismic zone is, they're going to have to build according to the building code, which is adopted by the assembly, put out by the International uh, Code Council, International Building Code, and they're going to have to build according to that. And all those specs are going to have to be met before any certificate of occupancy is granted. Thanks, Adam. Uh, to Jason, I'm going to kind of go to the top. To Jason, you asked a question about is 150 the real number? The 150 is set by code. I mean, they, they passed that. And so the plus 50 can only be activated after all other resources. So for, for sleeping capacity, if we, we needed to get to 200, we would have to exhaust all the beds at all the other facilities. And just so you know, citywide one of the asks that the mayor has done is he started reaching out he's been reaching out since he came into office but he started working with what i like to call the historic shelter partners and find out what they need to be successful because we had other people telling us programmatic people in the community that are part of the program but we went right to the source and said you know is there a service the moa can give to take catholic social services or beans or brother beans doesn't actually have a shelter operation right now but what can we do to assist you and you know because what we realized is that a lot of these options um, disappeared under COVID. And that was the reason to justify the Sullivan Arena, right? That historic sheltering partners were unavailable. Churches used to provide some emergency cold weather sheltering. 
Um, and during COVID, a lot of these things went away. So this isn't an excuse. We're just telling you the situation in the city. One of the things we're back to now is we're, we're looking at those partners and saying, what would it take for you to get back into emergency cold weather shelter? Maybe somebody else wants to get into it that's that's come up in the last two and a half years. So the neat thing that we have in Anchorage that we didn't have five years ago is alcohol tax, which one of many pieces of it is around homelessness and and that is the real benefit that we didn't have two years ago. Until 18, the city didn't really even have any kind of support for homeless operations. And the city realized that there was a, uh, a gap. And you know they tried to pass alcohol tax as a standalone for um, homeless uh, solutions, and it didn't pass. We added upstream preventions like early childhood, and it passed. And we and because of that, a significant portion of the alcohol tax goes to those things. And we make sure that the MCT is another alcohol tax funded um, service provided by the MOA that you know that we had a, a clear funding stream for. But to answer the question, there the the hard number is 150. To add that 50, to add one, to go to 151, there can't be a bed in the city. And so. I mean, at any time you could say, wow, there's always a need. Well, there's not a need all the time because a lot of people, I mean, we see this now. I heard someone mention the current count at the Sullivan Arena this morning at 7 a.m. was 134. So I heard someone say 510. That's the count. So when you hear that there's 200 people on the street with nowhere to go, that's not a true statement. There has We haven't been at max capacity since we were in the minus numbers. So I, I'd like to share that because I think there's this, this, misnomer that there's 250 people that would be at the Sullivan if there was some space. There's been plenty of space. It's rated for 510. That's the occupancy permit that we have. Um, and and that's what the, well, the occupancy permit actually is 6,600 when it was a hockey rink, but the fire department has allowed us to go to 510. And so, you know, there are beds that are reserved if you go down there for people. Um, but this morning's count that we got was 134. Um, and that's the people, you know, that were there overnight. That's how many people sheltered overnight. So, no, if you've asked, the Sullivan Arena is not receiving walk-up new clients. The Sullivan Arena is allowed to take in people that are in a situation. We've had 17 discharges from hospitals. We had a plus one the other day by APD. So while you can't use it as just a walk-up because you got stuck in town because your flight's delayed for two days out to Bethel. Um, we do have the ability to take care of the most um, impacted members of the community. And so, um, you know, that is something that's gone on. I, I know there was a letter that went around that people saw that said, we're not receiving new people. Well, no, we had had a discussion like anything. If you don't have a checkout time, I wouldn't leave my hotel till four o'clock in the afternoon, but it's 11 o'clock. Maybe I can get noon if I ask the front desk nicely. That's the kind of, I like to use that as an example of why we came up with a program to try to create an emphasis. And as you saw, 50 people got permanent placements in long-term housing last week from the Sullivan Arena due to the hard work of the contractor uh, through many, many community partners. And that's a real number, over 50 people. And that's why we're at 134. Back on June 1st, we were 278, and I think we had another 60 beds reserved for people that are at work and coming back or may have taken a day or two out. So yes, the program has changed over time, but we're in the final eight days. And part of that is trying to not have a whole bunch of people that don't have a situation. So, I mean, we have an intensive case management contract that has rent money. We have put rent money on the street, as you know, through a direct appropriation and an ITB. So there's a lot of options for people in the city. Do we have all the options? Absolutely not. And, but the navigation center is another option, and that's the whole point. Do anyone else want to jump in? Uh, Ian, sorry, I had to go get your name from the list, so that's why I got up. <laughs> uh, I'd answer your question to the uh, the sprung selection. Again, I came on late, and I was respectful of the perceptions and and what had happened with Sprung and conversations leading up to that effort. So we kind of inherited when the project management team changed between Rochelle Alger, uh, purchasing director, and myself, when we came on November and then uh, went through that process. And again, it, it all started when, when I was in a meeting with all involved. I said, considering the timeline, this is either a design build or a CMGC. And I know, Steve, I've brought this up at other meetings, how we got to this point. And 
Um, it allows you the fastest delivery method to get what you need. And because uh, it's a lot of simultaneous features of work just moving at the same time. And it happens fast. And it, it, it has been every bit of that on this, this effort. So once uh, Roger Hickel came on, became our apparent low, and then was selected as our construction manager, we went into contract with them. That allowed them to go out on our behalf and, and get pricing. And one of the first things they did, uh, because they did propose that their proposal was a membrane structure. We didn't know which which one. And so we did some market research. We identified, I can't remember, like three or four. Uh, I think they identified five and went out to an RFQ. Sprung was one of those. And so when we put out there back then, Jay, what was our occupancy now? 200 with 30 search? Yeah, 200 plus a 130. Or two, yeah, 200 plus a 130 surge. That was the uh, the square footage of the building was dictated by the occupancy. And so we knew that was the structures, right? So that was our square footage. And they went out for an RFQ with those five membrane structure manufacturers. We have a square foot unit price that they came down. They spelled out all the criteria when they when those when those manufacturers came back, sprung was the apparent loan. And so that now that we have a GMP, Steve, those documents will be loaded on the purchasing website. And so you'll see those processes, but um, that's how we got to where we're at. And uh, believe me, we were respectful and we were hoping, you know, maybe we could just cure that process and be with a new manufacturer, but can't pass up a good deal. And so we've, we've got a good product in front of us, but I am uh, respectful of, of where that planning was before we came on. So. I am not part of the construction process, but I can tell you when I heard it can go up at 10 foot a day, that's amazing. I mean, the building, you know, I mean, that's a 30 day up and you know, that's, that's amazing because I know buildings that are four years trying to get up in this town. And so, you know, and I think that's the benefit of using the sprung structure. Uh, I'm not in that piece. I did want to get back to a couple of the other questions because we promised answers as many as we could, but we couldn't. Um, SJ Klein um, asked about, you know, site planning and a bunch of other stuff. And, you know, I, and I think Adam alluded to this, one of the benefits of it being on PLI land was that it saved us about $5 million just in between the underground utilities and not having to acquire land in the process. Um, that's a value. Um, building a, per which didn't come up, building a purpose-built facility is always the preference, right? I mean, we can take an old building and convert it, but that adds a lot of, of, of complexity to a construction whereas as you saw in this diagram we couldn't buy this building that you see here if we went anywhere I mean, we could buy an old doctor's office maybe or an old warehouse and turn it into a doctor's office but we have a clinic we have you know office space for all of these ngos to come in and, and provide their services we have a warming center that was a tent this year this already is better the tent was uninsulated it was hard to keep warm when it got minus 20 especially with people coming and going we now have an r30 building that's what's normally in an attic a lot of the times, not walls. So, I mean, that's an amazing, just the whole building being R30. So I think there are a lot of advantages, but but to the point that SJ had, we are unreimbursed for $84 million. And while it's not part of this discussion, you know, we have to make some kind of change, right? Like the Sullivan Arena was not purpose built. I mean, it is a cement sarcophagus. There's not even a window in the place, right? And, and so, it's just a really difficult, whereas this thing is purpose built. A lot of the things that we, not just we learned, but the community partners brought to us about making it inviting to bring people in. We know historically at any shelter, people make multiple trips before they decide to go in. You might, in real life, you drive by a restaurant 50 times before you decide to try it. Maybe you try it the day it opens, but that's not what we find at shelters. They start talking to someone that's like, hey, I'm getting services, come with me and at least have dinner. And so that's the kind of concept that I want to share with people is that we recognize that we have to have a welcoming place. Come get a meal. Just come stay warm so you don't freeze tonight. Would you like to go into the bedside tomorrow? Let us check you in. And then we start the navigation process. Um, and I heard that. But, you know, health and safety, this is an option for them. This is where we take a look at you and say, wow, you know, somebody mentioned frostbite feet. This is where we can say, we can't do this outside. Please sit down, take your shoes off and let me take a look at them. And we start providing those services. We go, wow, that's bad. You know, that's frostbite. We need to get you before a surgeon that can try to save a piece of that. And that's really what this thing does is give us the ability to have the clinic, gives us the ability to keep people warm and feed them. And it gives us a place to navigate people to and from. I've said this before. I didn't say it here tonight. 
I expect people to come and go from this. They're going to go off to detox, come back, go to long-term treatment with, with maybe some job training, come back, and then go to housing. And so that's the whole mission here that we don't have in this town. Um, to the treatment question, the city has invested a significant amount of money in the earthquake damage 660 Salvation Army building. And it's going to be 68 treatment beds by the end of the year. That's a huge win. That doesn't come up in this. But I want to give a shout out to the Salvation Army. Even though they don't have the city's money, they've started that project on good faith with the MOA, just like a lot of things we do. And we really are trying to come up with as many of the options. Unfortunately, this comes up all the time. There's only a limited pool of money, and we have to get the best ROI for our dollar. And with that, the navigation center is in the same boat. We plan on bringing forward three levels, you know, an essential services level, an intermediate level, and then what I would call a deluxe level or every service you could possibly see on that list. But in the end, it's the assembly decides what the funding level is. The mayor hasn't asked. And the assembly decides we're comfortable with, you know, A, B, or C, and that's our job. So just bring them A, we're going to bring them, you know, these are what services we must provide to be an efficient navigation center. In a perfect world, we'd like to do the middle, B. In a great world, maybe the state kicks in. And that was my segue to the state question. We know that Anchorage is kind of a hub for the entire state. The mayor has asked and asked and done legislative appropriations and asked for money. So don't think that he hasn't asked the legislature and um, directly to the governor, because the governor has some discretionary kind of line items. And we're going to see what comes out of 22. As you know, it closed. There's some money that they're supposed to help with, and we're working with the state. Um, you know, DOC releases upwards of 2,200 2, people into Anchorage every year. We're working with them to try to see if they could provide some some housing for their their, their moder people under, whether it be monitoring, whether it's long-term release, whether it's waiting to return to the village they're from and the conditions of release get met. So we're asking them to step in. So it's there's not just, hey, we're gonna open the NAV Center. I mean, these are things that haven't been done in 40 years, and this has all been in the last year. You know, just getting DOC to the table. And then we have the complexity of the DOC commissioner resigned to run for office. So we were working heavily with the DOC commissioner and that gets handed off. But just so you know, those are the nuances that we deal with. Just like you're asking about, um, you, Jason discussed changes of uh, the assembly and the, and the administration. Happens at the state too. We're moving down the road and all of a sudden someone bigger, better places and we end up having to start over again with a new program administrator in some state agency. So. Just saying that's not something that we're not cognizant of. We do the best we can with what we have. And I know that sounds all Matlock year country, but that's really what we're doing. I'd love to tell you that, you know, there's this billion dollars in the bank and it's not a matter of us just writing checks. I wish that was the situation because we would be spending that money. I would just like to ask, um, does it need to be this cold in here? <laughs> I looked at my coat before I came here. I was like, I'm not wearing a coat. It's so hot. And now I'm loving this coat. I agree, especially <laughs> when it is such a gorgeous evening outside. Okay. Sorry. So we've had, um, haven't had any further people sign up um, to speak this evening. Um, so what I'm proposing, would like to make another comment? Yeah. Right. I would, would you like, like to answer forward? my question about the uh, impacts, if there's any concern coming from South Central and the Alaska Native Medical Administration about the impacts that it, it's going to hit hard in that area uh, once you guys set up this city. So have you? is there any dialogue going on about the concerns of the impact that it's going to have on the overall medical campus with Alaska Native? Absolutely. Turn it off. Yeah, probably. 70 and 50 percent hearing loss so i'm loud i'll apologize if you're ever face to face with me and i'm loud i, I can't hear myself um the answer is absolutely we've had those discussions and it's not just them it impacts providence which is fairly close um it impacts uaa uh, not just south central there but south central further up tudor where they have their child care we've reached out and we're working with them um, they are not too concerned because a lot of these a, a majority of the clients already are receiving services there. So I, I think one of the big things to consider is that when 60%-ish are already South Central slash Native Medical Center clients, they're already impacted by those folks. So having a resource 
that actually, you know, maybe they would get to their appointment if they were only across the land bridge and the bus came as opposed to being lost on the street. We obviously know this is going to have a huge impact wherever it is, um, you know, and that's why we're here trying to mitigate these things. But yes, we've had contact with them. We're working with them. They're going to be, you know, they provide, for instance, South Central, most people know this, provides the medical at Brother Francis currently. So they have an operating knowledge and dealing with the medically fragile homeless. They're intricately, intricately involved in up at the Sockeye. Um, in fact, all those medically fragile people from Brother Francis moved up to the Sockeye at the beginning of June. And Brother Francis is back to kind of its, um, while not nearly the capacity it has been to Ron's point, um, they are back to being a true um, homeless shelter down in Brother Francis. That occurred as of 16 June. So that, that, that piece has happened. Now they're not nearly the capacity, they don't have to be. And I think the last piece that should provide some security for people is they have to have a homeless shelter license now starting January 1. And we've already started these discussions. So I know people talk about the impact down at Wright and Tudor on um, the gospel mission, for instance. As part of that process of the shelter licensing, they will have to have a shelter license. And so we are working with them to make sure that it's not just this. You know, the benefit of the Navigation Center is that it's cast as some um, uh, education on the health department that holds shelter licensing. So I do note that too. But yes, we absolutely have reached out to Alaska Native Medical Center, South Central Foundation, um, and, uh, and a lot of other community partners in that general area. ASD, for instance, because they have a bus farm, right? So, I mean, it doesn't sound like much, it's a bus farm, but the last thing somebody wants to do is in the big rush to jump in in the morning and you had somebody passed out inside of the school bus. That's 40 kids standing in the cold because that bus can't roll out while we deal with that. So we, we, we are doing the best we can, but yes. Jason, you had some further questions. Yeah, so um, the Saka Inn, why has the construction started Saka? And that's because I go by there every day. It's done. It's done. Done. I've seen a lamp in the window for months and it hasn't moved. So well, why is there a crowd of people? I was going to take a picture today because there's a crowd of people, some of them medical fragile in wheelchairs. So why isn't this up and running? It is up and running fully. It's got 86 people in it. It's at full capacity right now. Okay. When was that? That started June, well, sorry, June 6th. There was a delay in the equipment. It was due to open June 1. Okay. Uh, now, that is not a city facility, a private contractor. We donated money to the capital purchase. We donated some money to operate for the first year, operating dollars from the alcohol tax. But to be clear, that is a private entity that owns that, and it is, it is Catholic Social Services in partnership with... Um, which is Brother Francis, um, and that would be uh, with South Central's medical providers. And they are training them, cross-training some of the folks there for a low-level medical license, like a CNA or CMA license to provide additional services. That is fully operational and is at 100% capacity as of the first week of June, second week of June. Okay. And following on to that, you said about the, the, um, <laughs> the services that are being provided there are by a contract. So... Why and how did you guys come to the determination that it was best to contract out services at the navigation center instead of the city taking control of it and responsibility? Because in the past, we know we haven't had good success with some of our contractors at the Sullivan Arena, right? Yep. I mean, I know someone that got beat up down there by someone that worked for 99 plus one, and that's not good, right? It's not good for anybody. So why would we go ahead and move forward and move forward if it was an out of state plan? Right? It's not, it's not. Okay. So the, the contractor is Catholic Social Services. Catholic Social Services, the, so let's back up here, overarching question. This was a directed operation by the assembly like the $1.9 million direct appropriation. So the answer is that that was designated the recipient of the money and we uh, then, we then as the administration perform the necessary task to distribute those funds. How Catholic Social Services was settled on, while not an administration decision, the answer is they operate many, many facilities across the city from Clare House to Brother Francis. Brother Francis being basically the only operation in town that had, at the time, medical treatment facilities for the homeless and the medically fragile. So it essentially settled down to the point that they, um, they are the, what I would call, 
long-term operator of a, of a very close operation. While it didn't have rooms like you have at the Sockeye, they definitely had everyone that's been at the Brother Francis Shelter for the better part of the last two years have been medically fragile. They have not been open door a homeless shelter at Brother Francis, downtown Brother Francis. And that's how. So they were identified as able to meet the need, but as it's not our building, uh, that was done in partnership with the new building owner. Um, and what we had was we had a public-private partnership that came forward and said, we will own and operate this hotel. The only part that the city had a piece of was providing a little funding. We said, well, we would love to have a medically fragile. It's one of the planks that was identified through facilitation. Because it was one of the planks, we had somebody come forward and say, we will own and operate the building, maintain the building, and do all that. The city's investment is X, which at the time was $2 million is what we gave them. We gave them $1.067 million to operate the facility. So you're talking about $3 million of city money went into there because we see the long-term benefit of having a place for the medically fragile. But somebody came to us with a plan, that being Rasmussen with all these other partners. So the building was many millions of dollars more than that, the city's piece. But so we got that facility online with a minimal investment of city money. But the navigation center, who was that contract going to? There's nobody yet. It hasn't even gone out to RFP. Okay, it hasn't gone out to RFP. All right, but we are looking for someone in the state of Alaska. It's, not it's going to be an RFP. We don't get to say that. We can set preferences. Are you talking about the SME, the subject matter expert? Yes. The subject matter expert, we don't have anyone. The closest I would say would be Covenant House is a is essentially a navigation center for the 20 and under homeless. Um, and so I would say that they are, um, you know, the only thing around Anchorage that kind of equates to a navigation center. But still, because this is a much different kind of navigation center, we are out looking. What we've asked is we've reached out to many of the operating, the successful um, cause there's not successful navigation centers around the country too, but we've reached out to the successful navigation centers and asked if they would provide us that subject matter expert guidance, either at no charge or for a fee. And they're going to identify someone, uh, and that's an actual process. So sometimes we go out to an RFP, but right now we don't know what to ask for. So we're in the collecting data on what we want in an SME by talking to the SMEs and saying, if you were hiring somebody, what would you hire? And they're identifying that is in purchasing hands. So they go out and find the parameters. We don't know what we need for, um, you know, police vehicles. Well, let's ask the police departments, what's the best vehicle, for instance. And then we say, let's get some Ford Explorers, right? So that's where we're at. We're, we're calling around now to these centers saying, if you were hiring an SME, what would you be looking for? And once we have all those things, A, B, C, Z, then we'll add them to an RFP and release it for an administration SME. We're going to expect the operator to have their own SME, bringing two SMEs to the table in Anchorage at our navigation center. One of ours, one of yours. Um, can I just pause you there and hand over? I'll do one more question, Ron, and then I'm actually going to wrap for the evening because we're getting close to time. Ron. Well, I was the first speaker, so maybe I'll be the last. Uh, and Adam, I understand the old Beans Cafe is going to become a navigation center, but my property was a $50,000 study, went to the neighborhood, accepted it, went to the Third Avenue Radicals, they accepted it, the community council accepted it, but you went out and purchased other properties. So it was kind of an empty promise that you were going to buy me out. And I got to tell you, these people at these other sites are going to suffer. And if they suffer even one, one millionth of what I suffered because of what you talk about in conditional uses will take care of you. And you mentioned going to Beans and the Brother Francis asking what they need. What did I need when I went to you? For 40 years, and not once out of 40 years, did code enforcement do anything against their conditional use. I want out for my sanity, for my family, for my business. Buy me up. It's been vetted. You threw me under the bus as you are going to do these other residents because you're not going to be there for them. It's impossible. It's impossible. So I want out, 
and you shouldn't throw me under the bus like Love Canal after you polluted, contaminated, and made my property unsaleable. You have the money to buy me out first, and then you can do what you want down there. But don't bring me any more homeless, because that would be an injustice beyond belief. Because I have the documentation that 15,000 calls in a year, and you did nothing to help all the business and the adjacent property owner, but rewarded the failure of the Brother Francis shelter in Beans as good partners. And that's a shame. And you're making the same mistake again. So I'm going to beg you, you have the money. That's a well-known place for the homeless. You have everything there. You have the Brother Francis shelter that's going to go from 75 to 240 to 360, the overflow. You have kids' lunchbox making the meals. You have everything going for you there. Short walking distance. I want out. I believe I earned that. And out of just justice, you should buy my property and let me go on with my life. What's left? One, one quick comment, please. Uh, I graduated from the University of Alaska Anchorage in the social work master's program. So Anchorage has a university in its backyard, and it's got two schools of social work for the bachelor's and the master's level students. I heard Assemblyman Peterson say part of the problem with your overall scope of the navigation center is you don't have professionally trained social workers in there helping out to get these people where they need to go for the complex problems of homelessness and addiction going on in the city. So here's my strongest recommendation. Just if you haven't done it already or have somebody on your committee, you've got committee on committees, have somebody go over because the PhD professors on that campus have already studied over and over again the homeless problem in Anchorage. They've uh, research studied addiction. They're master's level social workers. We have to do a research project in order to graduate from our master's program. So there's a wealth of information over on that campus that may help guide you into how to recruit professional social workers to help you out. Because good intentions is not going to help you down the road. You have to have trained people to know how to transition people from step one until they exit out and they're on their feet and they're back into their old regular life and routine. So please do that. Have somebody check it out. No, I, I think that's a great point. And we actually found a lot of interest from UAA. They brought that up uh, at, our, at our meeting with them. And so that they actually want to be a part of that operation of plan and their resources for you know those, those social services, the trades, bringing up um, you know, people at, into operations as a part of training, but also drawing from the expertise that they have. I think Joe has something to add as well. The bachelors and the masters, we have to have a practicum. So three months out of the year, UAA is churning out bachelor, a, a, a minimum of 100 students, nine months out of the year, every year. So partner okay. with UAA in getting these students to come over and do their practicums in for free. Great point. Yeah. So, let me back up and uh, I can't speak to what the assembly member said. I can tell you that we have licensed clinical social workers on staff at the municipality for homelessness. Okay. Can we always be fully retained? No, we're always probably in the hiring mode, but we have those people on staff. We also have MHPs and counselors that are licensed. So I would note that, yes, we could, we'd love to work with UAA. We, we have a, we have a, um, at the health department, I have training programs with the nursing division, with the mental health division. So we have those already. Um, but I can tell you that secondary, in addition to the trainees or students or interns, we have the full on, on staff at the uh, MOA, we have licensed kind of clinical social workers. Hi, everybody. Thank you. All right, everybody, uh, we are reaching the end of our scheduled time for this community meeting. And I just wanted to thank all of you for your questions and input. 
Um, comments and questions are welcome at any time throughout the conditional use permit process. And the Planning and Zoning Commission hearing is currently scheduled for Monday, August 8th. Um, please visit the project website, um, moanavigationcentre.com, to reach us, or email us at moanavigationcentre at dal.com and fill in the survey to provide your comments. Thanks once again, and have an excellent evening.